Um, again, welcome everyone for joining this meetup group. And my name is David Okiade. So I am a cloud security consultant. I'm also a Microsoft Azure MVP. So I have over a decade of experience in cybersecurity that ranges from cloud consultancy design implementation. Um, I also have over six years of experience as a trainer, so I do deliver um, official Azure certification courses. So I tend to focus these days on um, just research on cloud penetration testing techniques. So there's actually some, some nice work that we have coming out very soon, shortly on that. And actually that's what one of the reasons why we founded this meetup group was to focus on those areas. So anyways, let's see what our agenda will look like for today. So again, apologies if you see some glitches in the slides. That's because for some reason, um, the slide that I was building, you know, part of it got lost somehow, I'm not sure. In between saving on my Mac and trying to access on my Windows PC. Okay, here's the agenda. So the first thing that, we could, that I'm going to just talk about is why this different approach to cloud security education. We're going to do some containerization primer and just, just get a little bit familiar with the concept of containerization. We'll talk about Azure containerization options. So we'll spend a lot of time talking about what are the options that are available in Azure, what are the different um, scenarios or the different, the different use cases that you're built for. And we're going to look at containerization security model. So this is the crux of what we're here to talk about today. So what, what are the different security models that we need to pay attention to when we're talking about container security? And, you, and as you see, um, that's one of the reasons why container security is so complex is because of the different, in some cases, non-related security models that we have to deal with in order to be able to get this right. So we'll talk about that in that section. Uh, we'll talk about Kubernetes attack metrics, and I have a demo that I'll show to you. So again, hopefully, um, in between transitioning <laughs> in the slides on my Mac to my Windows PC, hopefully I'm still able to reconstruct some of the scenario that I created earlier. So um, let's, let's get into this to begin with. So one of the reasons I mentioned that we started um, that we started this group was to focus a bit more on the offensive side of Azure security. There's a lot of content out there already. If you want that information on um, Azure Kubernetes Service security best practices, you'll find tons and tons of information out there already. So there's no need for me or for us to really try to reinvent the wheel in some of these cases. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to expose some other side of security education as it relates to Azure, right? And that's talking about um, offensive security, right? How to think like an ethical hacker in relation to the Azure cloud platform. And now we're going to be applying that to containerization services in Azure. But before we do that, let's go over very quickly some containerization primer. So when we're talking about continuation primer, usually we're talking about three main aspects. We're talking about the aspect of development, which usually involves some form of containerizing an existing application, or you're writing code for a new application and then you're containerizing it. In other words, you're building your container image, you're getting your application and you're getting your application packaged into this container image. And then you're going to be publishing that image, um, most likely to an image registry somewhere where you're going to be distributing it from that image. And then we have the runtime, which is actually when you get that image from the registry and then you get to run that image as a containerized application. So that's sort of like what we're talking about here. So those three stages of building your container image to start with, publishing your container image to the registry, and then running your image as a containerized application. So but when we talk about the aspect of building your container image, uh, what are we talking about? So usually like when developers are creating container image, they use something called a Docker file uh, to create the container image. Now what a Docker file is, it's a simple text file and it has step-by-step -step instructions on how to build a container image. And you see one of the reasons why this is important when we talk about security, to make sure you understand these three aspects of containerization, all the way from build, and all the way to runtime. It's not just focusing on runtime. So that's one of the differences between container security and traditional virtual machine security. Uh, you really have to be involved all the way from this stage. So um, we have a Docker file where we describe a step-by-step -step instruction that we're going to use to build our container image. 
And typically you have um, Docker in installed on the, on the system, on the PC, in the build system somewhere. You use the Docker build command, you run that against your Docker file, and then you get a container image. So essentially what we're talking about here is, you have a Docker file, and that describes how to build your container image. You run Docker build command against that Docker file, and then you get a Docker image at the end. But what does the Docker file look like? So here's what the Docker file looks like. So you can see that um, it's it's as on the left hand side in blue. What I've highlighted here is that I lighted um, the instruction. So one minute, let me get um, a, an highlighter here. So let's go to that. So we have the instructions here, right? And then we have um, the different um, values. So for example, we have a from instruction here. And what that from instruction is describing in this Docker file is it's specifying the image that we're going to start with. So in other words, that, that's what's called the base image, right? So what we're what going to do is it's going to go grab that image from a registry somewhere. By default, that goes to a registry called Docker Hub. So it's going to go out to Docker Hub, look for an image with that name, grab that image, and that'll be the base of this new container image that we're building. And you can see why that is important when we're talking about security, because a bad security decision can be made at this point. So for example, I could pull down an image that contains a lot of vulnerabilities. And when I do that, you already have a bad security decision all the way from the beginning when you're creating your image, right? So then we begin to have like our instruction. So for example, we have a run instruction here. And what is run instruction is doing is it's going to be running this command within the image. So in this case, we're just running make directory. We're making a directory and we're going to be creating that directory. But then after that, we have another instruction, which is the copy instruction. And this instruction is used to copy files from the host. So in this case, with the application that the developer is building, the application is stored in that location on the local, on the host itself. And we want to copy that application from the host into a container image. And that's what the copy instruction is used for in this case. Um, we have the work directory. Um, we have the work directory instruction, which is used to change the working directory, right? It's like, you know, your CD, if you're, if you're using like Windows, you're changing your directory. So that's what that is specifying. We're changing the directory to say, can we change this directory to the location where we just copied some files from the host into? We just copied our application into that. So then we change it to that directory, and then we have some instructions run. So run me, which, which in this case we're using run to essentially compile our application to say we've copied our application into this directory on the image, run this command to compile it. And at the end of that, um, we, have, um, we have the command instruction. And this command instruction is different from the run instruction in, in bit. So um, it's different in the sense that it's used to start or to describe the um, command that will run whenever somebody goes to deploy this image. So that's what we're doing here. So this is saying, okay, I've compiled my application. I have my JavaScript file. Whenever someone wants to run this image as a containerized application, I want you to start and by running that command line, which is a, which we essentially run our application. So that's what this is describing. So these are just an example of a Docker file, and I thought that would be important to show that to you because that is where security decisions begins from the base image that we are selecting and also the kind of files that we are copying into our image. All those have a say when we talk about security. So let's move on to um, the next slide. So once we have like a Docker file that way, so we can use Docker build and then we specify Docker build, we specify the location of our Docker file, we specify the tag. Um, that we're going to use to tag our image. And when we run that, then we're going to have an image at the end of that. So that's essentially how you go from, you have an application, you're containerizing an application, now you have a container image. <clears throat> but how does this translate into the world of Azure, right? So we have these three aspects. How do we interpret this in the context of Azure? What options do we have when we talk about building container images in Azure? storing and distributing container images, and running our containerized application images. So when it comes to building container images, 
we could just deploy a virtual machine on Linux, um, a Windows virtual machine or a Linux virtual machine, install Docker on that virtual machine, and then use that to build uh, containerized um, uh, images. Right? So we could do that. So that's an option. And obviously, that's not the greatest option because that involves a lot of manual processes um, of deploying the virtual machine to begin with, downloading and installing Docker. But also, there's a management overhead going forward. We have to manage the virtual machine, the operating system, the Docker engine going forward. So even though it is an option, it's not the most desirable option. Uh, we have another option where we could use something called Azure Pipelines. Azure Pipelines is one of the services um, in a service called Azure DevOps. So we have Azure DevOps and it has multiple services underneath it, including um, source control, which is Azure Repos. But it also has um, a, a CI CD tool called Azure Pipeline that we can use to essentially orchestrate builds and releases. So we could do that. So here's an example of orchestrating the build of a container image using, um, using Azure Pipelines. So on the left hand side, we have our Azure DevOps organization that we've created um, on the left, on, sorry, on the right hand side. And on the left hand side, we have our Azure subscription where we have certain resources in, in this environment. So we have our repos, which is using Git, and then we have our different um, code files, um, Kubernetes manifest files, and then different files to use to build our container image. So here's a sample flow of using pipelines to automate the build of container image. So the developer makes changes to the code, pushes it into source control, um, source control grabs those um, changes and, and it's going to use that to it's going to trigger a pipeline. And within this pipeline, we have different tasks. And one of the tasks that we have in the pipeline is a task that's going to grab the um, latest version of the code. It's going to containerize it using something called Docker Compose. And it's going to push that new image into the Azure Container Registry. And then once it's in the registry, that's available for services like Azure Kubernetes Service to pull down images from that for deployment. So that's essentially like a, a, another option that we could use rather than the manual approach. Um, another option that we have is to use something called Azure Container Registry Task. So I'm not going to go into this um, in a lot of details. One of the um, one of the use cases for this is to automate the patching of our images going forward. Because as, as we'll see when we get to the security aspect, this can be something really complex because we're talking about massive scale here. So Azure Container Registry task allows us to be able to say, in this location where we're storing our images, I want to automatically trigger a rebuild of the image. Maybe if there's a later version of the base image that's available, I want to automatically trigger that from within the registry itself. So rather than me having to orchestrate that in a pipeline, we can let Azure Container Registry do that job. And you do that by implementing something called Azure Container Registry tasks. So when it comes to storing and distributing container images in Azure, we have a service called Azure Container Registry, right? So Azure Container Registry, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in, another, in the next slide. Um, when it comes to running container images, we can build a virtual machine, install Docker on that virtual machine, and then use it to run a containerized application. Right. Again, this is not the most optimal option. It has you know, a lot of management overhead going forward. But we also have platform services like container instances. We have platform services like App Service, Azure Functions, and Azure Batch. These are all services that allows us to run our containerized applications using platform services. And this is something that Microsoft are rolling out to more and more services in Azure. I remember like a um, few years ago, uh, Azure Batch didn't have the option to um, accept container images when it comes to if you're running something that's, um, that's custom in terms of your high performance compute workload. But now Microsoft has extended that capability to see if you want to run a high performance compute workload in Azure using Azure Batch services, you can specify a custom container image that contains your application and then Azure Batch can use that. But you can see other platform services that support the capability to run containerized applications. We also have the option to use managed container orchestrator platforms. And these are mainly three services that are available in Azure when we talk about this. We have Azure Kubernetes Service, we have Service Fabric, 
and we have OpenShift for Azure, so which is built in, um, in collaboration with Red Hat. So Microsoft and Red Hat collaborated and built OpenShift for Azure. And all these three services are managed container orchestrator services. In other words, we do not need to um, manually deploy them. We do not need to manage some aspects of the services, right? They are managed by the platform for us. That is some aspects of that. And we can use them to run a containerized application in a distributed and orchestrated format um, using any of the three services. So Service Fabric is <laughs> one we saw like an interesting one. So it's like Microsoft um, Container Orchestration implement Implementation. So it's essentially it does similar thing that what Kubernetes does. But it was built by Microsoft at a time when Kubernetes was yet to support Windows containers. So Microsoft essentially built DS called Service Fabric. But now Kubernetes supports Windows containers now, so not just Linux containers. So uh, we'll see what goes on with Service Fabric. But Service, um, Service Fabric is what powers a lot of other Azure services. So Azure services like um, Azure SQL, they're powered by Service Fabric in the backend. OK, so when we talk about the storing of our images that have been built, we are storing them in this registry. We have Azure Container Registry, which is a managed Docker registry service that we can use to store and distribute container images. Now, it's based on an open source solution, which is the Docker Registry 2.0. Um, this is the same um, service that runs Docker Hub, for those that are familiar with Docker Hub. So that's the same one that's running Azure Container Registry um, also. So um, um, it can help us to mitigate the risk of malicious container images. So the advantage of that is rather than our developers going out to Docker Hub to pull down their base images or maybe even publishing um, their containerized uh, um, images publicly, we could have a private registry that we can, where we can store trusted images and they can pull, you can use that essentially as a source of truth. They can pull trusted images from that, use that to build their, um, their, their images that they're building. And also they can use that as a place, to, a central place to publish whatever images that they need to distribute. So the good thing about Azure Container Registry, as you can imagine, is that it does tight integration with multiple Azure services. So in other words, if you wanted to deploy an image from AC Hub and you wanted to deploy that into another service that runs containerized applications like Hub Service, you have the option to easily select your image from there because it has this tight integration between serv this service that stores and distributes container images and services in Azure that we can use to run um, container images or containerized applications. Okay, um, so quick overview of how AC Hub works. So AC Hub, first of all, we create the registry. So once we create the registry on the left hand side, we have a VM or a system that a developer is using that has Docker installed on it. Um, developer runs the Docker build command to build two new images, the front end version one and back end version one. And once they're built, the developer can spot both locally. So they have you know, the two versions of um, Docker containers. And then they can push those images once they're built. They can push that into Azure Container Registry for storage. And then whatever service that we're using to run, containerized application, whichever service that it can be as an image cache. On the other hand, we can deploy, we can use something like Docker Run, for example, if it's something that, um, if it's a service that we have that level of access to, we can simply pull our images from the registry into the image cache and run them locally. So that's how that works. Uh, we're going somewhere where we're going to go into the security models, but it's important to lay this groundwork of understanding these different options that are available in Azure. So because it's also good for us security people to know what are the range of services that are available to developers in terms of um, how they are doing things, um, in, terms, in terms of the new processes that they're using, what services are available to them and what services that they're using. So it's important for us to lay this groundwork so that's why we are spending a bit of time doing that. And we'll get to the security part in a bit. So it's important to talk about the tiers of Azure Container Registry because it has to do with security. There are three tiers of Azure Container Registry. However, if you're really serious with security, there's only one tier for you. And you see the reason for that in a minute. So you have the basic tier, which supports basic functionality, like you can uh, do authentication with Azure AD, yeah, you can integrate with webhook where you can say if there's a new image that lands, I want you to trigger this webhook. 
that maybe triggers a pipeline to, to grab the latest version of the image and, and, and deploy that. So it has those basic um, capabilities, but apart when it comes to security capabilities, um, it's really light. So it's not one that you really want to use if you're really interested in security. So the same with standard, it has the same functionality as basic, it only has more scale. So it doesn't really have a lot of security rich capabilities. But when it comes to premium, that's where we get secu uh, security capabilities like um, content trust, which allows us to be able to sign our container images. And that's very important, <laughs> right? Being able to know that the image that you're pulling has not been tampered with, right? Because again, everything starts from that stage of building. If something is ever compromised in this chain, that we're looking at something is ever compromised that's going to affect what's going on in the runtime so we want to be a bit careful with that so we can implement something like private endpoint which essentially can help us to avoid where people are poking at our service because the service it's not available by public endpoint it's available privately if the services that are going to be consuming images from this don't need to be available on the internet why should we make this service available on the internet so but if you want to implement this kind of capability, you need to use the premium edition to be able to implement that. So Azure Container Instance, which is one of the platform services that we talked about, Microsoft describes it as the um, simplest and fastest way to run a container image in Azure, right? So you have your container image in the registry. Essentially what this is, is it's a managed Docker virtual machine. You say to Azure, Azure, can I get a Windows PC or a Linux PC that has Docker installed? And I don't want to manage it. That's essentially what container instance is. It's a managed Docker VM. Don't manage the VM, leave that over to Microsoft. You just get it deployed and you describe the container images that you want to run. So the good thing is it does not require us to provision the virtual machine ourselves or to maintain it going forward. Um, it has a faster startup time than if we were to create our own virtual machines. Um, it's also ideal for isolated containerized workloads. So if you don't require anything that, that has to do with orchestration, we'll see what that means in a minute, then you can use this service. Um, so set, it's also a simple architecture scenarios like just task automation or just build jobs will benefit from this. It also supports both Linux and Windows containers. So it has both of those options. So let's see how we're doing with time and let's see. Okay, so let's go back to this. Let's, let's, so I believe that this is, after I go through this next slide, then we'll get to the security bit. So the last service that I'll quickly introduce to you is a service called Azure Kubernetes Service. So Azure Kubernetes Service is a fully managed Kubernetes orchestration service. We're not gonna get into like the full bare discussion on what Kubernetes is, but here's a bit of like, um, it just introduction for those that may not be aware on some of the capabilities that Kubernetes provides. So if you're familiar with like your VMware cluster or your Hyper-V cluster, um, you know that enterprises that likes to run um, those, those services, they don't like to have a single VM host, right? You have a single ESXi host or you have a single Hyper-V server. That's not sufficient for the enterprise. What happens if that fails? It doesn't have capabilities like high availability. So what you do with in the VMware world is you have another service called VMware vCenter that's essentially going to orchestrate your workloads across multiple ESXi hosts. In the case of Azure, that is the, um, the Hyper-V, System Center Hyper-V Manager, where you can use it to orchestrate. So you can say if, if um, your virtual machine dies on one of these hosts, the orchestrator can essentially restart your virtual machine on another host. So that is essentially what Kubernetes does in the world of containers, right? It does things like scheduling, right? It can detect and say, um, this particular Docker VM or this particular Docker host has more capability to be able to run this workload. Therefore, I'm gonna provision this workload on that Docker VM. It can do affinity and anti-affinity. So maybe you have certain containerized applications that you want to run together, maybe for performance reasons, or maybe you have certain containerized applications that you don't want to run together maybe for availability reasons, you can define all those, 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 um, those kind of structures um, when you're deploying your workload using Kubernetes, uh, the Kubernetes manifest file. So it does health monitoring, it does automatic failover. If, if a pod um, fails on the Kubernetes um, host, it can, automatically it can automatically restart it on another node and, and make that available. It, it can, you can specify auto-scaling um, descriptors 
Um, it does service discovery, which is great if you have multiple instances of your services spread around across multiple hosts. How are they going to detect one another? Um, Azure Kubernetes service and does that. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll stop here. Let's go talk about like the security aspect of this because that's what we had to talk about. So, but hopefully that lays the groundwork for the containerization options in Azure because that's part of the agenda that we discussed. So, um, when we talked about the modern application stack, it's distributed and it's very complex. So, from the bottom hub, what, what we have is let's get this. So from the bottom half, we have a platform, right? And the platform, so everything is built on that platform security model. So in the case of our conversation today, that platform is Azure, but that could be AWS, that could be GCP, that could even be a private cloud in your on-premises environment. So, but on the platform level, when we talk about the different attack vectors on the different security issues that we could get, uh, we're talking about security issues like platform misconfigurations, where people misconfigure the services on the platform itself. So we're talking about service misconfigurations. We're talking about overprivileged access that could happen. That could even be platform bugs. Um, so there was one recently with Azure Hub Service that was discovered where someone could escape from a container running in an Azure Hub Service and could use that to access the host, the underlying host, which, which wasn't meant to happen, but that was a bug that a security researcher detected just like about a month or so ago. So obviously they informed Microsoft, Microsoft uh, responded to that by patching that very quickly, but there could be platform bugs, which could be like gateways into your environment or into, you, into uh, whatever workload that you're running. So that's sort of like what everything else is built on, it's built on the platform. So do not ignore the platform when we talk about container security. It's an important part of that conversation. Um, then we have our orchestrator. So the orchestrator is what automates the process of running our workloads in a cluster of machines. So these days, it's usually some form of self-managed or cloud provider managed Kubernetes or OpenShift. So Orchestrators, they usually have roles. They have like roles like the, the so-called master role or um, master node or the worker nodes. So however, when it comes to this, this layer, the orchestrator layer, some of the security issues that we could encounter there are orchestrator misconfigurations where people have misconfigured um, the, the orchestrator itself. So weak credentials is another one. <laughs> so, um, or even things like exposed dashboard. So apologies for the repetition here. Yeah? So when it comes to the operating system and the kernel, which is what the orchestrator manages when we talk about the, the nodes is the official term that Kubernetes used for them. So those nodes, they have operating systems running on them. That operating system could be Windows, it could be Linux. Majority of workloads these days probably gonna be running on Linux when we talk about containerization, but they are definitely um, Windows containerization workloads out there, right? So, so a lot of that also still exists. I don't want to make it sound as if they don't exist, but majority will probably be um, Linux. And even if we're talking about so-called serverless containerization options. So for example, you're running your container in, in an Azure function. I hope that you are aware that they still run on servers, or if you're running on Azure Container Instance, it still runs on servers, and those servers have operating systems on them. And when we're talking about that, we are talking about security issues like kernel bugs or file permission errors in terms of um, operating system misconfigurations and third party library vulnerabilities, and just a lot of other good or bad stuff, depending on the pers perspective that you're seeing things from, uh, that could exist in that layer when we talk about that. Then on top of the nodes themselves, we have our containers that are going to be running on top of that. That um, most likely is going to be using Docker, but there are other um, container engines out there apart from Docker. Um, so and on this layer, we're talking about security issues that we could encounter. So that includes things like um, exposed secrets. So people have um, configured secrets in, uh, in, in an insecure way and, and are exposed talking about issues like insecure networking, um, root privileges where they've given too much permission to the container to have access to the host itself, where someone could maybe escape from the container and begin to move around on the host itself. Uh, talking about vulnerable images, which we mentioned a bit of that when we looked at that containerization um, primer. So these are all issues that we could experience on, on this layer. 
And finally, we have an amazing application. So we have an amazing application that's probably talking to some database service somewhere, right? And our application is probably talking over APIs to other containers. It's probably talking to some external services using API also. And it needs to be able to authenticate with all these different services that it's communicating with. And on the application level, our application, even though it's, it's an amazing application, can come bundled with all kinds of issues like SQL injection and cross-site scripting and SSRF and CSRF, CSRF and remote code executions and memory corruption and dependency vulnerabilities and every other vulnerable exploit known to man can, ex ex can exist in our amazing application. So, but what this, this slide, or the reason why I put this slide in is, it's meant to give you a generic summary of threat models and attack vectors that affect container deployment, right? And as you can see, there are aspects of this that are similar to traditional deployment security using virtual machines. So many of you are already familiar with that uh, model. So they are part of that that you can see that it, it's, it relates to existing, um, existing security concerns. However, there are also some container specific threats and especially when you're talking about orchestrator and the container layer. So there are some container specific threads that we ought to update ourselves on uh, when we're talking about this. So let's go um, back a bit because I believe that I'm not sure if this is messed up. OK, so one minute, let's go to that. And let's do this. OK. So here's essentially here's what we have um, in terms of the security models. So we have a code and a code is running inside a container and the container is running inside a node or in a cluster of nodes that's managed by a cluster orchestrator or maybe by a cloud service like Azure App Service or Azure Function and that's running on a cloud platform. And what you're looking at on the screen, it, this is what makes containerization security a complex thing to achieve. Because, because each part of the stack that you're looking at here, they operate on different security models. The security model for the cloud platform is different from the security model of the orchestrator. Um, it's different from the security model of the node, the operating system itself, or for the container, or for the codes that you have. So these have different security models that, you, that you're using for each of them. And that's what makes it complex. And if you don't get anything out of this presentation today, one thing I want to really leave you with is this term, ecosystem security. It's very important when we talk about container security. You have to think of things in terms of the entire ecosystem. Right? It applies to every aspect of security, but more so in this area, especially when we are talking about the scale of the cloud, and also the pace of modern development, being able to move software from all the way from source control very quickly into production, you have to pay attention to the entire ecosystem. And that's why you hear a lot of talk about DevSecOps and trying to shift some of those um, security governance to the left to be able to handle some of these issues before things get all the way into production. So um, let's have a quick look at something called the Kubernetes at attack matrix. So we're not going to go over everything, but I'll just, just show you um, just some descriptions on, of some of these issues. So we have this attack matrix. So this attack matrix is something that was defined by Microsoft and it defines the tactics, the traits and the techniques that essentially uh, bad actors can use. But apart from bad, bad actors, it can also be used by an organization's red team to be able to simulate um, just attack patterns for your containerization environment. Even though Microsoft, when they released these, essentially targeted it towards Kubernetes, but essentially, if you look at the different tactics that they've listed, it goes beyond Kubernetes, it actually covers uh, the entire containerization um, landscape as far as I'm concerned. So we won't be able to go through all of this, obviously. So, but what I'll do is I'll start the conversation. Let's look at initial access. Hopefully I'll be able to show you around that, that part. Um, so let's start with initial access. So initial access, we have the option that uh, we have the point where an attacker can use cloud credential. And this is the one that I'll try to show you a little bit of demo of that. Because what you must realize is that you can't just focus on the application and just the container and the orchestrator itself. The cloud platform itself affects 
your um, your entire security. If someone can compromise a credential to your cloud environment, they can essentially get access to your orchestrator that way and probably access to your um, containerized application or to, or to be able to inject code into that, or maybe even to be <laughs> to be able to um, destroy things, or maybe to even to be able to spin up things in your environment. So that's an important part um, of your security is the cloud platform itself. So the first one of using cloud credentials. So talk about an attacker may be able to gain access to a cloud provider account. So that, that could be uh, a managed identity enabled service. They've stolen a token from that. That could be an admin workstation that's been compromised that has cached credentials for your Azure environment and that. Uh, whatever way they've gotten access to a token or to a service principal an ID, and they can use that to compromise the rest of your containerization landscape. So we have the other option of compromising images in the registry uh, or compromised images in, in the registry. And this is referring to um, unsafe or compromised images, maybe images that have backdoors installed on them that people have downloaded from maybe a public image registry like Docker Hub. There have been lots of cases in the past where people have downloaded uh, malicious container images or from Docker Hub because it's not as if they go through like some extensive scanning before they are added there. So th that could be a case, or it could maybe a case of where people have been able to upload a malicious image, or a vulnerable image into your own private registry. And now that's being used across your environment. So obviously, uh, to be able to mitigate against this issue, you want to have some kind of continuous vulnerability checks against the container images that you're using, that you're storing in the registry, but also that you're running in production. So you want to have some, you know, some, some form of continuous assessment of those. And it's important to do that. So a compromise, uh, so we have the cube config file. So cube config um, for those that may not be aware, so that's used by Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. And it essentially contains the location and the credentials of the cluster, right? So if a client is compromised, or a Kubernetes client is, <laughs> is compromised, or a client that has kubectl, the client that Kubernetes uses, if that's compromised, then that can be used to issue commands to gain unauthorized access to your environment. So essentially, this can be like an, an equivalent of a cached credential for your Kubernetes cluster, and now an admin client has been compromised, and now once they've compromised that, they can use that to issue or maybe invest, you know, cube configuration from that, or maybe use that to gain access to your environment. So that's one way that people can gain initial access into an environment. So um, in this case, um, so the next case, application vulnerability. AppSec is still AppSec no matter where you are, right? Application security is application security. Because you've containerized your application does not mean that fix all the SQL injection and other issues that you have. So you still have to do your, your um, SAST and your DAST and your pen testing of your applications that you're hosting and you have to do continuous dynamic testing and vulnerability assessment of the application layer of what you're hosting in your Kubernetes environment. Um, so a good example of that is you're hosting an application that has multiple vulnerabilities in it, and, and maybe it has like a remote code execution vulnerability, then an attacker scanning the public internet, being able to access, um, being able to exploit that vulnerability, gain access um, into your container, and then, God forbid, you have things configured incorrectly on that container layer that we saw, you know, we saw the different layers. You have things configured incorrectly where they could escape the container. Maybe you, your container is running as root, and then they can use that to essentially get to other aspects of your environment. So application security is the application security regardless of where you are. And that is still one of the main, main entry points into a containerized environment is application vulnerabilities. Um, you have exposed dashboard. So, so um, the Kubernetes dashboard is sort of like it's a web-based user interface that we can use to manage our Kubernetes environment. The issue is by default, some Kubernetes versions, some, 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 some Kubernetes implementations of versions, they deploy the dashboard by default. And the sad thing is many people are not aware of that. So essentially they've deployed this Kubernetes environment there's a dashboard that's running with default credentials and they have no idea that it's running in the back end. And that's probably now exposed to the public somehow, right? If that's exposed to the public, then that can be used to gain access to your Kubernetes cluster environment. 
and then that that can be used to do all sorts of things from that aspect. So you, you can see where, where that can be dangerous. And actually, this is something that happens real world um, in terms of Tesla. So that was the uh, attack vector that was used to exploit um, um, Tesla's Kubernetes environment. So actually, let me go over here. Let me see if I've got, yeah, I've got the news over here actually. So I'll bring up the news for that. So that was the attack vector that was used to compromise um, Tesla's Kubernetes environment that was running on AWS in this case. So you um, can see this topic that was written by Redlock, uh, which was acquired by Palo Alto. So it essentially goes into details on, on what happened in that case. So what happened was they again, they have like a Kubernetes dashboard, they have that exposed. The attacker were able to access that because it was available on the internet. And then what they did from there was instead of compromising things, they just spun up container images that has crypto mining software installed and just use Tesla's AWS environment to mine crypto, right? So that's like an entry point that, that could be possible with that. So um, let's see, I'm, I'm almost out of time here. So what I'll do is I'll just see if I can show you like a sample of a demo. Um, and then let's see. Do, do, do. Let me see if I can show you like a sample demo in terms of the initial access. And I think I'll stop there for today. Maybe we'll have a part two where I'm going to be describing um, the other aspect because it, it's a lot to go through, right? The execution. And then what I would like to do ideally is to show you like a demo of one of these different um, layers of the attack matrix. So, but anyways, let's go to uh, the demo that I've got. So for here's an example of how of this one, Compo uh, sorry, using cloud credentials, right? So it's an example of using cloud credentials. In this case, there's, a, there's an um, the web app, Azure web app, that's running an application that has a vulnerability. Now it's available to the public. So um, an attacker is scanning Azure IP address ranges, detected that this application running on this web app has a remote code execution vulnerability, and then they were able to access that. Now, the thing with that is, this, this application, because it needs to be able to access um, set or read information from other parts of Azure, it has a managed identity attached to it. And a managed identity is a way to obtain temporary tokens um, for the application that's running um, within the service. So in this case, the attacker is able to detect that, oh, this compromised application actually has an attached managed identity and then it makes a request to Azure AD to obtain the token for that managed identity. Uh, then the token only has reader permissions. Okay, but what damage can you do? You're thinking reader permission. Yeah, they can read what's going on in the environment, but what damage can, can you do with a reader permission? Lots of damage. So in this case, the attacker begins to use the reader permission to essentially fingerprint the Azure environment and just do credential hunting across the environment. And they detected that there's an Azure container registry that exists in this environment. Guess what? Reader permission can be used to gain access to container images within the container registry. So essentially use that reader permission to gain access to that container image in the container registry and begin to do credential hunting on that and detect that OMG, this actually has a client ID and a secret key which by the way, has permission as a contributor to the subscription. So that's an example of how an attack chain has flowed all the way from just cloud credential to now using um, a containerization service in Azure because with that permission, actually it's not just reader <laughs> in this case, it actually has permission to be able to read information from your container images and then being able to do um, credential hunting from the credential and then use that to escalate their privilege to gain access to other parts of your Azure environment. So, um, you know, I've got like just a few more minutes, so let's see. So one of the years, uh, there's a container registry that's one in this environment. So by, by the way, if someone is interested in seeing an example of the, um, the, the compromise of this web app part, if you're interested in seeing that part, because I'm not going to go through that. If you go over to uh, my YouTube channel, you see a demonstration. So the title is called How Vulnerable is Your Azure Environment? I showed a full demonstration 
of how an attacker could scan this web application, detect the vulnerability, how uh, they exploited that vulnerability to retrieve the token. So that, that demonstration is titled Our Vulnerable Charge Environment. It's on my YouTube page. Go access that and you'll be able to see that initial aspect of that. I'll just show the containerization aspect of that. So there's a reader credential that's been compromised. What do we do from there? So let's go over here. So reader credential compromised or reader token compromised in this case. So what I'll do is I'll just run a few uh, commands to see. And da, 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 da. so just again, just read the permission. Look around and can see that I've got a container registry DOACR or 211. OK, so because I have, I have a credential that has read the permission, can begin to hunt around and say, what repositories exist in this container registry? Right, so listing that I'm like, oh, look at that. It actually has an image um, called NodeHub that exists in that repository on this container registry. Okay, so again, reader permission, it's not just about reading because <laughs> it's what can you read is the main thing about that. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to pull down that image and we're going to see Let's see. So if I go that, so ah, okay. So uh, da, 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 da. um, let's see. Ah, I can see where I've made a mistake. So my bad. I'm putting the wrong one. So it's actually called Node App. So I've gotten that image from that registry. So then we can begin to just hunt around and see what exactly exists in this. So if I do Docker image list, now that I have that locally, I can see that now I have, let's see, I've got a bunch of other images here. But one of the images that I have is now I have that image that I've just pulled down from that container registry. And now that I have that image pulled, what I can do is I could, for example, just do let's see uh, okay let's fix that so now the image that i've pulled down i'm going to run that okay so logged into the environment here so the container image that i've pulled down using with permission is running so what i'm gonna do is i'm just going to verify that it's running so if I run that, i can see that that's running and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, let's see. I'm going to access, I'm going to do some credential hunting. I'm going to access some environment variables that may have been injected into this container image. And again, uh, there's a mistake there, so I've got to fix that. So let's go 311. Let's do that. And here we go. So in this case, what a developer has done when they're building this, is they've actually injected a client ID and a secret key. Um, as environment variables in that container image, and I can access that. So now I have a client ID and a secret key that I can load up on my attacker ma machine, and I can essentially begin to fingerprint the environment to see what kind of permissions that I has into the environment. So that's an example of that attack chain right there. So this all attack chain that we saw. So um, we're almost out of time now, and I want to be able to take some questions. So what I'll do is that you know we have other guest speakers lined up. So we'll be announcing um, other meetups again, focused on offensive Azure security is what we're focused on in the, <laughs> focused on in this group. So we'll be announcing other meetups. So make sure you um, stay in tune with the meetup page. However, what I'll do is I'll schedule other con Azure container security um, con container security sessions where we could go into the other threat models of execution persistence, and I will try to show you a demo of each of those. So let's see, do we have any questions? Let's see. So I can see someone has a question. Do we have any, um, is the session recorded? Yes, the session is re recorded and the session will be published to my YouTube channel at the end, at the end of this. So it is recorded. Does anyone have any other questions? Any other questions that you may have? So just a quick um, information. So is this something that you found to be useful? Because again, uh, if you didn't find it useful, it's probably not worth trying to 
um, go through the entire pack matrix. But in case you find it useful, uh, just let me know, put it in the chat window or something, so I know whether to put together <laughs> the, the other ones after we have our guest speakers. Ah, nice, nice. No, okay. So I've seen a few people say, this. yeah, no, thanks very much. Okay, so if that's useful, so thanks very much for joining the meetup today. So again, uh, we'll be, let's see, any certification for container security is another question. So there, there is no certification for container security focused on container security by itself, but there are some very good books that I can recommend. So uh, there's a book titled Container Security by Liz Rice. It's a very good book on container security. Um, there's another book titled Kubernetes Security by O'Reilly. It's another good book on container security. So I can recommend those, those two books. They, they are good in that aspect. They are not comprehensive or complete, but they are very, very good point to understand the fundamentals of those different layers that I described to you today. Okay, if there are no other questions, thanks very much again everyone for joining. Again, watch out in the Meetup group, we've got some amazing stuff. Oh, okay, one minute. Oh, I've got another question. <laughs> so this is the final question that I'll take for now, uh, so we can keep the time. So it says, does Azure Security Center provide plans for providing insight and recommendation for containers? Yes, it does. So Azure Security Center has an integration with um, Qualys um, in terms of, um, for example, scanning the images in the registry. But again, when we talk about container security, um, to answer the question um, in, in a much more complete way, always keep this in mind. Keep this picture in mind. You're talking about multiple layers here, and you're talking about all these different aspects, uh, different security models. The way you manage security for applications is not the way you manage security for containers, it's not the way you manage security for operating system or for the platform. So for example, for the platform, you're talking about CSP and cloud security posture management, and you know it's, it's different security models for each of these layers. So what I'll say is Azure Security Center does have some good stuff to begin with, but it's by no means all comprehensive. I personally prefer something like uh, the Prisma Cloud um, solution because I think it's much more comprehensive than, than what Azure Security Center has. But yes, Azure Security Center has um, capabilities that could get you started, it does. Okay, so let's see if there are no other questions, no, no problems. Thanks very much. Another no question. Thanks very much again, everyone, for joining, and I'll see you next time in a meetup. So bye for now.